The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hey guys. How are you doing? Tired? Me too. Mentally exhausted. Well, hopefully uh, this lecture will mentally stimulate you. We're, uh, we're going to go over Archimedes. Arch correct me. If I say Archimedes one more time, just, I don't know. I don't need I can, Archimedes. <laughs> Archimedes. Uh, he's a really cool guy, so we're going to cover some of his stuff. With a D. <clears throat> Albert Speer. We'll give everyone else a little bit more time. But, uh, oh, uh, Mr. Dubik said your packages are delayed. How, did anyone actually get their package? Nope. Kevin. Nope. Yeah. Um, so no one else. No one did. It sounds like um, the the storm uh, delayed Amazon or something like that. So. Uh, I think the latest update was you should be getting them by Monday, maybe. Um, who knows, though. Amazon will give them to you sooner. Soon, soon, uh, hopefully sooner rather than later, but they'll get them there eventually. Let's see. Um... Let's see, Kevin, last, uh, I'll give you a quick review of what we did last time while uh, we're waiting for other people to show up. Um, to give you the, the summary version. Let's see. Let's change this to... Here we go. Uh, we kind of did an intro to simple machines, starting uh, with ancient engineering and ancient technology. Uh, so uh, we covered the, uh, the definition of a force, which is a push or a pull, um, and uh, that work. Ignore the cosine. Just trust me, it turns out to be times one um, in all the cases that we'll talk about. So it's work equals force times distance. Um, that's the the main equation that we've been talking about. Um, the most important thing to know is that you can't. I mean, work work takes work takes some moving something takes a certain amount of work. You can uh, all of the simple machines um, make it generally make it easier to accomplish work in a, um, by either changing the force, you know, increasing the force to be less distance or increasing the distance to, be, to give you, you know, so that you can use less force. Um, usually it's increasing the distance that you, you move something and you can, that lets you apply less force and accomplish the same amount of work. Um, so uh, some examples of that are, um, well, an example of the, using the equation, <laughs> uh, some examples of using this equation are, um, this man picks up 25 kilograms, uh, kilogram weight, he moves it up two meters, and so the work done on that weight um, is the force, which is not clear from the picture, but uh, that 25 kilograms is being pulled down, has a force down on it by gravity um, that's equal to 10 meters per second squared. Um, that's a constant. 
gravitational constant. And so the force it pulling down on the weight is two, uh, 250 newtons. So this guy lifting two meters uh, against a 250 newton force, uh, the work done is force times distance. So he has done uh, 500 joules or newton meters of work. Um, the, the math isn't so important as understanding the relationship. Um, so uh, one important thing to note with work is that, you know, in the scientific and engineering definition of work, work has to involve movement. If you pull on a door and the door doesn't move, the, the door has no work done on the door. Um, you can say, in general, there's no work done on your body either, but in the microscopic level, your muscles tighten and sort of that sort of thing. So you feel, you feel it <laughs> because your body is moving and it is expending energy to pull on the door. Um, but that's all at a molecular level, and so it's a little more complicated. But the door doesn't move, the door, so the door has no work done on it. Um, going into the simple machines, um, which are things like, well, these are, the, these are the simple machines, the lever, the pulley, the incline plane, the screw, and the wedge. Um, uh, yeah, so, oh, and the wheel and axle, which there's not a picture up here. Um, so uh, all of these simple machines accomplish, uh, they, make, they make work performing easier when they're used in the right way or in a clever way. Um, the, they all do some or all of the above, uh, transferring a force from one place to another. So maybe a pulley, uh, you transfer the force from pulling a box up, you get to pull horizontally on the pulley, and the pulley pulls the box up. So that would be transferring the force from one place to another, and at the same time, changing the direction of the force. You're pulling horizontally, and the, the box goes up. Um, you can also increase the magnitude of the force, or the distance, or the speed of the force. Um, for example, um, if you choose to walk, take, walk a box down, an in, or push a box down an inclined plane, it's a lot easier, um, though you have to go far, farther than um, carrying it down a steep drop. Um, or to put a screw into a wall, if there were a hole in the wall um, that the screw just fit through, it'd be easy to push the screw horizontally into the wall. Um, but of course, that wouldn't do much. Now, um, if you want to, well, it, okay, this is a better example. If you push a nail, if you imagine pushing taking off the, the screw part of the screw, and you push that into a wall, just so as sticking a nail into a wall, right? That's not easy to do, just pressing with your finger. But you can accomplish the same amount of work with a screw by adding those ridges. You turn and you increase the distance, so you decrease the amount of force that you have to apply. And the screw slowly but surely goes into the wall, and you have reduced the amount of force you have to give the screw for each twist. Um, and I'm not going to cover um, the ideal mechanical advantage and that sort of thing. We'll go over that again later um, and the calculation. So let's skip past that. Looks like it might just be you two today. Um, so while we're at it, um, Kevin, do you have any questions about what we just talked about? I know that was quick, so um, but I need you. Uh, <clears throat> I need you both to be on the same page before we get into more details. Let me. Sorry, I'm just changing pages. Crazy. On it. Let me leave it here. Um, nope, you're good. Great. Okay, so um, <clears throat> let's. Uh, we'll we'll get back to more details of simple machines. Um, later we can we can touch back on that again. Um, we'll we'll be coming back to this this quite a bit. 
Um, but I want to go and teach you about Archimedes first. Yes. Um, we'll get into some specifics here, and then it, it'll make everything else more clear, too, I think. So, uh, we might even actually watch a video. Um, so, Archimedes did a lot of cool things. Um, we're going to talk about some of his simple machines, and he even combined a few simple machines to make more complex machines, um, uh, especially with the steam cannon. You'll see there's a lot of different things going on there. Yes, there's a death ray, um, and the, the claw, which is uh, was pretty ingenious. Let's see. So, as you can tell, especially back in the day, um, the threat of war is responsible for, uh, as it says, huge advances in engineering and mathematics. Um, Roman and Greek weapons all over the place, you know, they were pioneering lots and lots of different weapons, um, which we'll see in a moment. Um, but even in the more recent times, in World War uh, Two, the, well, in World War One, the airplane advanced, um, you know, or Orville and Wilbur Wright flew the airplane. Uh, yes, Gabe, do you have Albert Speer? What about Albert Speer? He's a good architect. Okay, cool. Um, well, we could uh, we could touch on Albert Speer in a future lecture, maybe. Um, I'll, I'll make a note. All right. So, um, yeah. So, uh, Orville and Wilbur Wright they they had they invented the airplane, the concept of the airplane. Um, that the first successful concept of the airplane, and then war took that and advanced it by a lot in world, you know, because of the, the war applications. And then you know, the war was over, but airplanes, um, you know, it, it pushed it pushed that technology along to the to the point where, um, n you know, in the near future, commercial aircraft was possible. And now we fly, we take flying for granted. Um, Similar things um, with uh, medicine. Um, penicillin was invented uh, by uh, a doctor. I can't remember his name um, or her name. Um, by uh, but the, but it was invented during World War II, and it, uh, it was the the it was made a lot more readily available. Uh, they, when they found out it cured infections, um, it uh, the production of penicillin, which is a, a big point. Like just because someone discovers something doesn't mean it's going to take off or can take off because often it's expensive to produce a little bit. But war put made the production of penicillin um, very important because everyone's getting injured in the war and a lot of people die of their wounds rather than um, and sicknesses rather than uh, you know just being shot and die immediately. Um, so medicine, and then the last example as war as a motivation factor is um, uh, what was I going to say? World War Two. Um, me uh, yeah, uh, modern agriculture. Um, the, a lot of the materials used in uh, the, the factories were producing for uh, for war. Um, the the I mean, in the bombs, the napalm bombs, and that sort of, all of the these high explosives. Um, they these factories were you know were producing and producing and producing, and then all of a sudden the war ends, and these factories have capabilities of producing lots and lots of chemicals, but there's no application for them anymore because there's no more war. And they discovered that these chemicals were high in things like nitrogen and phosphorus. And that was a really great, um, it was a really great nutrients for plants. And so with small modifications, they could take these highly explosive chemicals and turn them into, uh, you know, fertilizer in of the modern era. 
and they can push plants to their extreme like growth potential and uh, you know it, it it took agriculture to a new uh, a new level um, and I, I'm, I can't I might have mis misspoken when I said napalm um, but uh, oh I have to look this up um, but I think it was it had to do with the invention of a better nitrogen fixation. Um, I'll, I'll look that up for you, um, because that it was that there was a one the Haber process. Um, you can Google that H A B E R process. Um, that this guy turned um, they, he made nitrogen fixation so much easier um, and more efficient, and it led to the development of, of all modern day fertilizers. Maybe not all, but you know, uh, you know what I mean. Um, anyways, uh, let's let's get on with uh, with the lecture. So back back and go way back many many years ago, um, we've got Archimedes. Uh, he grew up on the island of Sicily. Um, he's known. Uh, well, let's let's watch the video first. 213 BC, and Syracuse here in Sicily is a critical link in the chain of an embattled Greek Empire. The Roman Empire is on the ascendant, and Syracuse is their next stop. The Greeks built a number of city-states dotted around the Mediterranean, and when Rome began to expand, Syracuse was right in the way. Unfortunately for the Romans, this was the home of the genius Archimedes. He fortified the city walls with such incredible military contraptions that he stopped the Roman war machine dead in its tracks. One of those contraptions was the claw, a kind of crane that reached out over the city walls, grabbed the enemy Roman ships and dashed them on the rocks. Archimedes was the greatest mathematician of the ancient world and probably the greatest mathematical genius until Isaac Newton. His inventions range from the famous Archimedes screw to water clocks, pulleys, winches and many more. When the Roman fleet approached Syracuse, legend tells us that Archimedes set fire to the enemy galleys with a new invention. But how did he do it? In a local school is a statue of Archimedes, which holds a clue to this devastating invention. It's possible that this large dish was a highly polished bronze shield that harnessed the power of the sun. The mirror on my bathroom wall might double as an ancient bronze shield. Okay, well the Greek soldiers may have used their shield, and then they could reflect the sun onto the boat, a bit like that. So how would it feel to be an invading Roman on the receiving end of this new weapon? If the Greek soldiers had lined up along the harbour walls, the reflection of the sun off their polished bronze shields would have acted like mirrors, concentrating the sun's energy onto the Roman ships. And the soldiers would have been completely dazzled, if nothing else. I mean, they wouldn't have been able to see where they were going at all. What further damage could they do if the Greeks had hundreds of shields, all reflecting the power of the Mediterranean sun at the hapless Roman? So, Marty, what have you got here? Well, I've got a few mirrors here. 124 ah, to be precise. Wow! 124 hexagonal polished steel mirrors. Oh, and each one is held in the centre and individually adjustable. On the back are four screws for each mirror, and that allows you to adjust oh, it. Oh, you And I can steer each mirror and focus, focus on. onto the well, boat. Well, I, I happen to have a Roman boat in my hand. We'll, we'll see what we can do. You think you can set fire to this? We'll try. Pop on the post. Pop it on the post. Okay, well, hang on a sec. Hang on a sec. Don't fire yet. There. Right, okay. Ready? Do there your you work. There you go. Coming up. Oh, that's bright. That is very bright. I can't even look at that. I have to look at the back of it. There's smoke beginning to appear already. I can see the paint blistering. Yes. There it is. No, I think that would be very bad news, and you couldn't possibly attack that with this blast of, of ray gun in your eyes. And I think if I were a Roman sailor, I wouldn't fancy being in that boat very much. I have to say, Marty, yeah, you 
even though there aren't flames, you have burnt a hole in the side of this boat. I can see straight through from the inside. So that boat is now sinking. Now I've locked it off now, so let me come and have a quick look. Right. Well, don't go too close. Okay, so he's taking out the whole side. Ah, oh, flames! 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 Fantastic! That really there is you good. Go, that boat. There you go. Pretty yeah. positive. Yes. And you only need 124 mirrors. And this is in, you know, in <laughs> southern Italian sun. I think it, it would be a lot It would be even better. That is spectacular. A funeral pie to the Roman Navy. A triumph for Archimedes. Yeah, absolutely. Good for Archie. The pressure of war forced the Greeks to be inventive. They were at the cutting edge of weapon technology. Their military engineers made clever use of ratchets, winches, and multiple pulleys. They set principles of design that lasted for a thousand years. Back in 400 BC, even the simple bow was improved by their inventiveness. This is David Sim, who is our ancient weapons expert, and this is a gastrophites, or belly bow. David, show me. Right. That slider pushes forward. Okay. Yeah. How far? Oh. Keep going until the hook goes over the string. Oh, I see, like that. That's it. Right. Now push the two brass pieces forward. These ones? Yep. Right. And pull the trigger lever round to the right. Oh, I see. So that locks that down onto the string. Yes. Gotcha. Okay. Now then, to load it. Right. This is really a castle wall, isn't it? Yes. So you shove it, shove it against the wall. You will push it against the wall. Right. Put your belly against it. Right. Push. Like that. I see. And that cocks it. That's very funny. Okay, now you put it back on the castle wall. Put it back onto the castle wall like that. Right. Take your arrow. And these are just ordinary arrows? Yes. 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 And notch it. Notch it. Right. And then hey, aim. And you pull that lever and... Wow! Wow! Fantastic power! So you reckon that's twice as powerful as a normal bow? You can make a bow that's two or three times more powerful than a bow that a man can pull with his arms. Gosh! And all the strength is in pushing this forward. So you've got double the range. You yes. can keep the enemy well out of bow shot. Yes. Fantastic! Yes. And you don't need to be a skilled archer to use it. That's, and that's extraordinary. This was probably the first ever mechanical weapon of war. It was a real step forward. <laughs> okay, that's that's it. So, um that's an introduction to the type of inventions Archimedes developed. Let's see. Make sure I show you the right screen. Oh, I don't have to change screen. That's right. Thank you. Okay. Um, and uh, I'd like to point out also that Greece was especially motivated uh, to invent better technology than their opponents, opponents because they were outnumbered in many of the battles, yet they won. Um, they, I mean, they were they were the leaders of war in the uh, on the Mediterranean for a long time. So, uh, one of the first thing we'll talk about is the is Archimedes' claw, which, as you can see, um, well, let me, you tell me what what um, what simple machines do you see here in this claw? Pulley. Yep, that's easy. You can see the wheel there. The claw. Well, the, the claw will be more apparent in the next slide. <coughs> you see anything else? We've got What about what about up here? Can you see my mouse?
Not quite an income, incline plane. What if I told you it pivots right here? The claw is over here, over on the other side of the wall. A lever, good. So by combining two very simple machines, the two, two, all he did was combine two of the most basic machines in a clever way, and uh, he was able to rip boats out of the water and let them slam back in and start and to capsize. And uh, you know, that that made uh, you know, that that was one of the many inventions that let the outnumbered Greeks uh, defend their castles from in ship invaders. Uh, we got a, a much quicker video to, so you can actually see how this works. There's sound. Maybe there's just no sound. Yep. No, that didn't break. I'll go back and show you again. So here, that's intentional. And you'll see on the other side why that flew off so suddenly. So see, it goes up to the point, and so I guess, yes, it did break, but it was by design. They're, they put a stick in there to hold the wheel in, the axle to hold the wheel in, until um, there's enough stress. It looks like, let's see here. Oh, maybe it didn't break. I didn't watch that far. So it was even more clever. It uh, it unlatched at a certain tension. And so by putting that stop in there, uh, I don't see a string to, to pull it, a trigger or anything. Anyways, I would I would suspect that even though they didn't show it in that video, that in the actual version, they had a that main pulley that they used to pull, and in that trigger that held the wheel in place, they had another string, and someone just had to give that one good yank, and that let the axle fly out, uh, or let the axle loose and the wheel flew out. And so all he had to do was, all, all you had to do was use the buoyancy Take advantage of the buoyancy of the water, and you can see here that the pulley is longer on the boat side than the pull side. Um, that is uh, partially by design, um, mostly out of necessity, because ideally you'd want a longer side on, you'd want this one to be longer, but that just made it too big. So they, they make this as close... Uh, as close to even as possible. Um, the reason I'm saying this is because if, say, this is one length and that's two times as long, then you're going to have to pull... I um, can't remember my math, but something about, let's call it twice as hard. Um, you might get into thirds or something because we divided this thing into thirds. But you have to pull about twice as hard to... Um, deliver this force because of this isn't in the center, right? Um, but if you 
put a, a, a pulley system in here, you can make that a lot easier to pull. And with a couple of guys, you pull in the, in the direction that humans pull very, very easily, and you can stack a bunch of humans along a rope to pull them uh, so that they can pull easier. Um, remember, humans can pull horizontally a lot easier they can pull than they can pull up and down. Um, and you can create this contraption. So let's go into a, a little, this is probably too small for you to see. Let's just go ahead to the next one. Oh, here we go. We got some, um, some, uh, so a more basic system here gives, uh, 50 feet. So here, this is what I, what I, why I was saying it was easier to be on the, you know, it would be easier to have a long side because if you uh, make this 50 feet on, uh, this is, can you guys see this at all? Yeah, you can see the numbers and everything? Okay. Um, I'm, I'm struggling to see the numbers, so I'm glad you can. Um, so up here, it's 50 feet uh, on the, we'll call it the ground side, and 25 feet on the water side. So, uh, and they're showing a leaden weight on there. This is different than the one we looked at before. Let's keep going. Um, we could we could look at it, but let's uh, let's let's figure out let's let's learn more about the the pulleys first. Um, pulleys and more about the pulleys and levers, and then we'll break it down. Uh, so um, so pulleys. Um, this is a good. This is one of the better definitions of theoretical mechanical advantage um, I've seen. How much easier a pulley makes lifting a load is described by theoretical mechanical advantage. Um, what that means is um, if you uh, have a theoretical mechanical advantage of one, then it for every one unit of force on one side of the pulley, you get one unit of force on the other side of the pulley. Um, now, a fixed pulley, it has a theoretical advantage of one, just like I was saying. You pull down on side P, and you the same amount of force is delivered on side W. Now, what gets interesting is when you combine this with a movable pulley, now, if this pulley, when you pull up, this pulley will get closer to D, the hook. And um, so what you're effectively doing is having, cutting in half the force you have to exert. And uh, that force you exert is doubled on the weight. So... That gives you a theoretical advantage of two. For every one unit of force, uh, you apply two to the weight. Um, now, keep in mind, the work done is the same because you have to pull a further distance. Um, so work equals force times distance if you have to pull twice as far for this movable pulley and half of the, at half the force, force times distance, you end up coming at half times two, and you still get one unit, you know, the same amount of work. So then we get really complicated, and we, you, if you, you call it, this is a combination of pulleys. It's called a block and tackle. Um, you have some fixed pulleys and some uh, movable pulleys with a single rope passing through it, and the easy way to determine the mechanical advantage is it's the number of lengths of rope that support the movable movable pulleys. So if you look at every all three movable pulleys, 
you can count one, two, three, four. That's the, those are the ones on A and B. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. So when you pull uh, on one side, the other side gets 11 times as much force delivered to it, um, which helps explain why uh, or how you can lift, I mean, a couple of guys can lift a several ton boat out of the water um, just by the, using the principles of this one slightly more, you know, slightly more than simple machine. Um, so uh, this some just is, just illustrates the terminology with another time for you. The fixed pulley um, changes the direction but doesn't change the force that you have to apply. The movable pulley changes the direction and the force. It cuts it in half. But the block and tackle changes the direction that you have to pull. You can pull in a lot more directions, but also it cuts it in more than half. So, pulleys. Um, now, the block and tackle was not, didn't exist actually when uh, no one had to develop that in uh, Archimedes' day. So, um, Uh, you know, what difference would the block and tackle make on Arch Archimedes' claw? Well, uh, you tell me, what what possibilities could you envision if Archimedes knew about the block and tackle or had it, had developed that? What could he have what could he have done to improve this design? Any ideas? Ask again. Um, so here there's only fixed pulleys. This pulley is stuck down here and this pulley is stuck up here. Um, I take that back. This is a movable pulley because this is getting closer to the other pulley. So here but uh, Archimedes only knew about, uh, you know, one pulley, uh, you know, one, one fixed one and one moving pulley system. Um, he didn't know about the block and tackle, which, um, you know, it involves lots of pulleys. So had he known about the block and tackle, what... Um, what what would have how could he have improved his design? Yeah, so if he if he used a lot more pulleys, what would that accomplish? Nobody? Well, he could have, um, it would have either, you could stick the lever farther away so you could pick up ships from farther away because that lever is extending out further and it's harder to pull a lever farther out, um, but you have more force with the, with, uh, with the block and tackle. Or, Yep, so longer pole, or fewer guys pulling, because maybe instead of the three guys here, if you put a movable pulley in here and you reduce the amount of force that the guy has to pull by three times, then 
you can one guy can do the job of three. So you save guys. And you have two more guys to spread out and do other accomplish other tasks. Gabe also says you could put a ballistic missile underwater. Unfortunately, they were not invented by them. If they were, the Greeks probably would have won a lot more wars. Let's see. So here's a uh, a Lego version. Um, We could very well be speaking Greek right now. Let's see. Let's go on to the next invention. Oh, shot, shot ahead too far. The death ray. Could he have, Archimedes truly have built a sun-reflecting super weapon? Well, I'm not convinced by the video we watched that that was enough because they set a tiny toy boat on fire six feet away from the device. Um, I think the Mythbusters tested this out. <laughs> Could have been missiles, Gabe. Maybe, maybe that's what, that's actually how they won so many wars. Um, I'm not convinced because uh, these boats were so much further away, and even if they had a thousand guys pointing, they could, they, you know, they they needed, they would need to focus that in one point, and the boats are moving. I don't know. I'm not sure if I believe it. Maybe maybe they're blinded, but I remain unconvinced. Um, but let's let's talk about what would happen. Maybe maybe we can work it out, you know, how this theoretically would work. So um, this picture shows a boat coming up to shore, and the guys hold their mirrors, uh, pointing it all at the same spot, and the focused rays of the sun... Uh, all combine at the same time, right? You get that. So uh, to be even more efficient, rather than having a flat reflector, um, if you have a specific point, you can um, form a parabola. Per, I mean, a parabola has a focus, a focal point. It's the perfect curve to focus all of its all of incoming energy um, that's parallel into a single point. Um, at a certain distance. So, um, you know, the problem with that is you have to adjust your parabola for every distance of ship. So, I don't know. It's possible, but unlikely. Uh, some other uses of uh, mirrors focused by the sun, you can boil a pot. Um, you can uh, hear the uh, there's a line running. These are all focusing on a simil on a single pipe that is very difficult to see, but it runs just above the solar panel. And so these parabolic troughs reflect heat into the pipe. And the pipe is so they they heat up the water running through the pipe or uh, liquid, probably water. That liquid um, heated up liquid. Uh, builds up under pressure, the turbine turns that pressure into electricity and the water cools down, uh, condenses through the condenser and uh, goes back into the pipes to be heated up again. So modern day use, uh, dish engine systems, similar, they use a, parab a, a parabola to focus their energy on a single point uh, that converts somehow that light into solar solar panels, I guess, converts that into electricity. Um, or you can have a whole farm of solar panels shining light at the single point where uh, they have a pump that runs water, cold water, up, and then it heats it up and it pumps it down into a similar system as we saw before, just on a bigger scale, converting it into electricity. So. Anyways, that's, uh, some people think it's possible, some people don't. Who knows? Um, that one's not verified. But the final one we'll talk about today, invention of Archimedes, is the steam cannon. We have a good video for this that we'll build up to. Um, this is sending projectiles using a buildup of steam in a 
container. Um, so does it make sense to you guys if I said an increase in temperature means an increase in pressure? Does, do you, you take my word for it? Kevin says, I assume that means, yeah, we're taken. Okay, so, well, you don't have to take my word for it because I can prove it to you. Well, I can show you someone who has proven it. Um, but first we'll analyze the states of matter. So solids, they're tightly packed together, and they don't move. In liquids, uh, the molecules are tightly packed together and don't move. In liquids, they move around, but they're still tightly packed together. Gases are not packed together at all. They, um, at atmospheric temperatures and pressures, they act as though there's no other particles at all. They just go around, and they spend most of their life not even running into another gas particle or anything. They just zip around. Um, maybe occasionally they'll collide, but rarely. They'll just, they float around. So, um, but they have a lot of energy, and they need space for that energy. So, this bright guy named Gay Lussac, he... Uh, tested uh, a lot of, um, he just did a lot of experiments with, uh, you know, the difference between liquids and gases, and he found that, um, or w with gases, specifically just gases, he found that if you increase the temperature, um, it's not, the temperature doesn't just increase when pressure increases, but it increases proportional to the pressure. Um, oh, where's the equation? Okay, well, no equation. Uh, you can just uh, look up K. Lussac's law to find out what he did, I guess. Sorry about that. I, I told you, you just have to take my word for it, like I said. Okay. <laughs> um, so we'll, I'll explain this, though. So um, here is a manometer which reads pressure. So the information we get out of that is um, in this sealed container, the manometer is also sealed. There is some gas particles sitting uh, contained in the beaker and being kept cold by ice. And this manometer reads one atmosphere. This is actually exactly the experiment that he performed. Um, and then he boiled that ice. He so boiling water. Um, so this temperature inside has nowhere to expand. Um, so since it has nowhere to expand, the pressure inside increases. Um, and he, he learned that by reading the manometer, finding that it now reads 1.37 atmospheres of pressure. That's a unit of pressure. So you increase the temperature, you increase the pressure in a sealed container. Now, as soon as that container comes un becomes unsealed, what happens? Release. Exactly. Boom. If it's a can, or fizz, if it's a soda can. So, let's watch the steam cannon video. It's time to light this homemade super weapon up. This is the first time he attempts to fire it. We're going to find out today whether Archimedes was right, whether the steam cannon could have fired. And I couldn't be more excited. <laughs> Archimedes' design is based on using water heated up to extreme temperatures over an open fire to create steam. When the steam is released, it propels a cannonball. Working with steam under this kind of pressure can be deadly. We're going to fire a five-pound cannonball, 150 feet, using nothing but a couple ounces of water. Pay attention to how much water he pours in. That's all it takes. Did you see that? Open the valve. Go back to slower. Using nothing but a couple ounces of water. Open the valve. That's all it took. That's all it takes. Steam has to heat the cylinder in 
enough so that the steam climbs to a pressure of at least 150 psi. Okay, pressure climbing. law, he just understood that when ga when water is boiled, it takes up a lot more space. When you contain that space, it builds up pressure, and when you release it, it um, you let it you let it give it an escape valve, it can go boom. So, um, again, that's another point to illustrate. Um, the difference between a scientist and an, and an engineer. Here, the scientist um, followed, uh, postdated the engineer by over a millennia, maybe two. I'm not sure when Archimedes Archimedes was alive. Let's see. Archimedes, 212 BC. Let's look up. Lusak, uh, 1778. So that's right around 2,000 years later, the scientist discovered the principle behind the engineer's weapon. Um, and I only point that out to note um, a philosophical difference between the scientist and the engineer. The scientist is seeking to explain how something works, how the world works, whereas the engineer doesn't necessarily care as much how the world works as, you know, how to accomplish a goal. And um, that's just, uh, you know, it's a different mindset. All right, so let's take a look at this. A little more closely, oh, this is a steam engine. Um, I don't think this is a very good diagram, so I'm going to skip it. Um, let's look at this one instead. So um, this is what, um, this is, a, this is a almost exactly, very slightly simplified version of what um, a power plant looks like that, the, the, especially the ones that use coal or natural gas, um, they um, the shipment of coal is delivered or the pipeline of natural gas um, is piped into the plant. They have humongous furnaces, uh, furnaces that um, are constantly, uh, you know, boiling water, a, a gigantic version of your pot over the natural gas burner or the coal fire, charcoal fire. Um, they boil this water. This, this boiling water has a lot of energy given to it by the um, chemical energy of the um, natural gas or coal. This energy gets pushed through, the, I mean, this, the gas gets pushed through the turbines um, and the turbines take some of that energy, and because they're taking they take the energy from uh, take this energy away uh, from the superheated steam, it condenses the steam, um, and that's where it's collected in the condenser, and it returns back. Um, now, one problem: Does anyone see a problem with this diagram right here? Just if it, if you built it exactly the way it looks. The generator would probably break and fall. Well, let's assume it's sturdy. Let's assume you build it with materials that are going to 
you know, these are just diagrams. This is just how it's supposed to look, and some mechanical engineer builds it to not break. I know you're joking, Gabe. <laughs> so, I guess I guess I'm like actually looking for a slightly nitpicky detail, but uh, what if I told you you need a one-way valve somewhere? The, you said the entire system with chemical engineering must be floating on that energy because the whole half would fall. So, no, this is the floor. This is on the ground. In the boiler, which which side of the boiler? The boiler to the turbines or the tur boiler to the condenser? Try the other one. So, Gabe says you need a one-way valve here, but if you had a one-way valve here, then your boiler water or boiler boiled air will try to force its way through and hopefully get through because that's where it's supposed to go. But it'll also force its way up back up through the condenser. So it's important to include these sort of one-way valves, which I'm not going to get into now. I can't even remember what they look like, but mechanical engineers and uh, practicing chemical engineers should probably know what one options are for one-way valves, and you can make them um, so that air cannot go back through this way, but water can get through this way. Um, you can Google it if you want to. If you're interested in more, but let's let's go. Okay, so time is not permitting to start the Google site presentation. Uh, have, you, have both of you two made Google Sites in your last, uh, my last time? Um, you know. Yep, both of you two? Okay, great. Um, and well, um, how many are in the class? Uh, there should be four people in this class, but um, Actually, there could be as many as six, but um, I'm not sure. I think the, the there was an issue with the, there's no 10 o'clock class this time, and some people were struggling. So we're trying to accommodate as many people as we can, but um, I'm not sure. Four people showed up to the first one, so yep, at least four people are free if they have the same schedule, I guess. But uh, We'll see. Um, if there's just the if it's just the two of you, then uh, we'll uh, just get to go at your speed and uh, give you that much more attention. Catapults next week, yes, uh, and hopefully, <laughs> you're funny, Gabe. Um, Hopefully, what was I going to say? I lost my train of thought. Hopefully, you'll get your uh, packages in the mail uh, by Monday. That's the goal. And I don't think I have anything else for you. Look up the Haber, the Haber process. That's pretty cool. I, you should be getting a new package in the mail, Gabe. Not just your robot this time, I think. It'll be something different. So that sounded cool. I want one, I think. Um, all right. I'll see you, talk to you on Monday. Oh, wait, yeah? Yeah, I know. I don't know why. Every time I, I just forget to change it, but I don't know why it, it won't remember me. I can, uh, it lets me edit it, but... You get emails from him that says this class. Yeah, I'll uh, I'll try to fix that. All right, 
You too. Have a good night.